to camps, and I found this in their bookstore. And this was written by Dr. Salehammer. He's a college professor, theologian, and his book was called Genesis Unbound. And I thought, wow, that's a catchy title. And so I thought I, had, I needed that for my collection. And he collaged a lot of different things, and his, his whole premise was evangelicals and fundamentals are picking a fight that does not need to be had. We're making a fight with scientists that we need to just hold to Jesus and the gospel and stop trying to act like Genesis is a science textbook and get in these philosophic and scientific fights with the hard sciences. This is pretty old now. It's probably 20 years old. Because maybe you feel, you're feeling like you're losing ground. I mean, with the gap theory, if you're losing ground, you've got to come up with something because evolution has been taught in the school. Sure. A lot of young Christian kids are, you know, leaning towards that and are losing their beliefs. So you have to come up with a common ground. And the thing that I thought about gap theory is that it's, it's sort of a, a comforting as a Christian because it gives you a way out where you could still have faith and, and believe in, in Christianity and still think, well, okay, maybe the earth is at all. But that and, doesn't mean right. that God well, doesn't, you, you know what I'm saying? You can have Jesus and eight men too. Right. <laughs> you can with the gap theory. Yeah, right. And I mean, maybe that was the whole Jesus. point of it. Well, uh -huh. what, what does that do for people who... Christians who want to work in academia, like those types of theories. Maybe it lets them that work for a place that they don't have to violate their conscience and they can sleep at night. Well, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'm not pretending to judge anyone. Now, in the past, groups like Institute of Creation Research and stuff would have said, if you don't take this kind of reading of the you're Bible, you're probably not even a Christian. Mm -hmm. Because... If you can't trust God with the first chapter of Genesis, why would you ah! trust him with yes. Jesus and all that stuff? Yeah. But well, I know a lot of people that are here, you know? and it's obvious they take a very literal historical Jesus. And I think ICR's toned their down quite a bit since then. Now, is it problematic if you allegorize some of the Bible and take some of it literally historically? Well, of course. But, you know, I think we probably all have our little hermeneutical foibles along the way. Well, let me keep going. Mm -hmm. Salehammer makes a huge point about context. And he's like, this is what most evangelicals seem to be missing. It's like, this wasn't written as a 21st century apologetic against Darwinian evolution. It was written to the Jews, leaving Egypt, going to Egypt, and why was it written? It was to prepare them to go into the land. And so he has like this allegorical mixed with, um, well, it's allegorical. He goes back to the allegorical, as far as I can tell. And basically he says, Eden is a type of Canaan. Now, do you guys fundamentally know what a type is? Yeah. Someone tell me. What's a type? Tell me your name again. Your dad? Yeah. Example. I can give you an example, like how... Yeah. Someone's a type of Christ, like Adam's a type of Christ. So it's an it's a an bad type. Figure. <laughs> but, yeah. or like the bronze serpent being lifted up in the wilderness, or the ram facing Isaac, or the tabernacle in the wilderness, or the veil in the temple is like. Oh, Melchizedek's a type of Christ. Yes, okay. So, but these types are actual historical events, but they have a deeper spiritual meaning behind them. Does that make sense? So there is a real bronze serpent in the wilderness, but it is a type or pointing to Christ. Or there is a real ram in the bushes, but it's a type of Christ. And so what he's saying is, Eden is a type of Canaan. So he's not saying Eden is a mythological place. It's a real place, but it's meant to teach the Jews that there are certain expectations God has for them when they come into the land. And so he starts, basically what he's doing, it's kind of like with the gap theorist. He says, in the beginning God creates the heavens and the earth. So this is the totality of the universe. It's right here. The universe. But then, when we get to Genesis 1-2, so we got the earth here, 
you know, we got the sun, moon, stars all out here, shining through the veil of the heavens, or however you want to describe it. But then, in Genesis 1-2, God creates Eden as like a sheltered garden on the earth, where he puts a hedge around Adam and Eve to protect them from things like pterodactyls and Neanderthals and T-Rexes. And there's four rivers throwing, flowing through the garden, and in it he places man, and from man he creates woman. And he has like a cherubim. And then we got the, the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the center of the garden, and the tree of life. This one you're not supposed to eat of. And so this is kind of what's being set up in Genesis 1-2, is this idea that Eden is a type of Canaan. And there's expectations. In Eden, it's no forbidden fruit, or no knowledge of good and evil. Going into Canaan, they get the Ten Commandments, plus the 613 to go with them. So you, I'm just going to put Ten Commandments plus. If you keep the Ten Commandments going into the land, God will bless you. If you obey God and don't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you live forever in bliss consciousness. Okay. If you eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, there's judgment and you die. If you break the Ten Commandments, there's judgment and you die. All right. What happened to Adam and Eve when they ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil? They were cast out. Right, they were cast out. Which direction? East. Very good. They were cast out into the east of Eden. Right. When Abraham was called to a land that God would show him, what direction was he coming from? East. He was coming from the east, from Ur of the Chaldees. East into Canaan. When Jacob had to flee, which direction was he going? East, back to the land of Haran, where his ancestors came from. When Jacob came back, what did he have to do the night before he entered into the, gar the Canaan? He spent all night with, with what? The angel. And what did God place to guard the garden when they were kicked out? <laughs> so 10 on the hermeneutical gymnastic scale. And basically he's saying... Can't you see Eden is just an elaborate type of Canaan preparing the children of Israel for the land or to inhabit? God blesses obedience. God curses disobedience. Now, I like it. I think it's very creative and clever. But it doesn't make sense. I mean, it doesn't make sense in saying the context of the rest of Genesis is, well, why sun, moon, and stars, and separation of the seas from the land, and it doesn't make sense, and the naming of all the animals, unless you're just talking about domestic animals, but it doesn't just say domestic animals, and so I like it, I think it's very creative, but it's, I'm not intellectually satisfied with this one, personally. So the magnetic thing, <laughs> oh, from, from your brother, yeah. Please tell me. He says that yes, magnetic properties of rocks can be determined from core samples, comparing orientations to current magnetic mineral orientation can show us how magnetic poles have moved. Can they tell us how old the rock is that they're in? Because he was whipping out those 250,000, every 250,000 years. The poles change. Right. Did he said that right? Right. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's where I think the loop's going to happen. With the, but we'll see. Okay. One more for your, two more for your viewing pleasure. This comes from the Kabbalah, and you can spell it with a Q or a K, or it's a transliteration. I'm going to use two B's because I like two B's. Kabbalah. <laughs> 
And this comes from a collection of Jewish mysticism. Mm -hmm. Some people believe it goes all the way back to the Tower of Babel. Some people believe it was developed when the Jews were in Babylon. Um, we know we have writings that go from the 7th to the 14th century um, in the Common Era. But the Kabbalah, mm -hmm. their creation account talks about God is the totality of reality, or Yahweh. Nothing exists outside of God. Nothing. Out here is non-existence. So what is this, like the opposite of, of materialism? Yes. This is, this like goes beyond the fundament, fundamentalist in this sense. This is like mysticism, Jewish mysticism. But this changed the way I thought about the world forever when I heard this account. And in the Kabbalah they said, when it says... God separated the light from the darkness, God actually had to make a space within himself, kind of like a cosmic womb, in which to create the world. Because God is light, God is pure glory, and so if God tried to create something within himself, we, it would be consumed away. So God had to make a buffer of darkness, and you could make this like a, a thick veil that God's placed between himself and the creation. And then, and sometimes I think about this at night, so God then begins, he separates the light from the darkness, and then he creates um, the waters, he separates the waters, he makes the earth, sun, moon, stars, and in some ways you can almost think of it as like, if this gives you an inkling of God's glory, if you imagine that this was a veil between us and God's glory. And what we're seeing when we look up at the starry night sky is like pinpricks in that veil. And if God took that veil and pulled it away and you saw pure light, it would be consuming. I I'm not suggesting there's a thick veil between us and God. So, just, is it saying that we live inside of God? Yes. Okay. We're in God right now. There's no... It's not it's like, like it's not like God's here and He makes us out here, but God is actually creating us inside of Himself. So God is not separate from the creation. He is. Because you could destroy all of this, but God would not be diminished in the least. This isn't pantheism, it's panentheism. Pantheism Pan is the Greek word for all or world. And then we have God, so you could say all is God. Panentheism. All is in God? Yes. Panentheism. So they go to like code. Oh no, this is the question system. So this existed in like what? Primarily like these were, I guess these writings were popular. Yeah, and today you would find it among like ultra orthodox Jews, like mm -hmm. the Hasidic movement, or people like that, so or Madonna, like, or people. Yeah. Or Tia, Tia and the Twins. Um, but do you, but I'm saying like the, the writers of Jewish mysticism um, were they popular during times of like, like the Old Testament, like the times of the books of the Old Testament being written, or you know what I mean? I think it came later. Okay. My personal belief is that it's a fusion of Jewish scripture yeah. with like Gnosticism and like Neoplatonism, like that great chain of being, and that, that's my personal view. Okay. But I still appreciate this view. Because then you have God creating man, woman, trees, you know, mountains, all this stuff, it's happening in context of himself. And see, the way I was brought up with my Baptist flannel graphs, you'd have like this blue felt or black felt, and then they put up the planet.